Words. TED speakers share words. That's how they share their inspiring ideas, isn't it? Words fascinate me. I'm sure I'm not on my own when I think back throughout my life, words that I've heard that I'll never forget. You might have had them yourself, you know. When you get that phone call and somebody says to you, are you sitting down? You know, the boss saying, I'm afraid I'm going to have to let you go. Or it's a boy. The words I'll never forget the one, are the ones I heard from my sister Sonia a week before my sixth birthday when she shook me awake. She said, Richard, wake up. Mum's not come home, let's go look for her. We left the house at 5.30 in the morning with our coats on over our pyjamas, wandering the streets looking for my mum. She went out drinking that night, my mum, and uh, she was a bit reckless. And um, what I had no idea is what those words signified and that I was never going to see my mum again. And um, coincidentally, we heard about Wilma earlier. My mum's name, my name was Wilma. And... Um, we made our way to the local bus stop and after an hour at the bus stop we gave up and went home. The police arrived at the house and they took us away to the local children's home. We never returned to that house ever again. Um, I've been living in this house, or we had been living in this house for five years with my mum and my dad. And, uh, and there was three sisters in total. In fact, my dad left when I was four. He was replaced by a man called Jimmy, my mum's boyfriend. He was worse than my dad. Because yes, he liked to drink and yes, he was violent. But he also liked to take drugs and he gave drugs to me and my older sister, Sonia. When we were kids, I hated that man. At the children's home... We were greeted by the staff, they seemed to know, or they were expecting us, and they, um, they were fussing over us. I was quite enjoying this attention they were giving us, until this police officer said, I've got something to tell you. I'll never forget his words, I'll never forget what he did. He crouched down like this beside us, and he said, um, he said your mum's been taken to heaven. You're not going to see her again. I'll never forget those words either. What we had no idea is what had taken place that night. Our photograph was taken... I thought I was taken at the children's home and um, it appeared in the national newspapers. In fact, the picture that I'm going to show you appearing in the papers was how some of my mum's brothers and sisters discovered what happened that night. And that is that their sister or our mum had been murdered. There's no easy way of saying that. She was found on the field at the back of the house, yards from where me and my sister Sonia walked and uh, she'd been stabbed 14 times. Hit twice over the head with a hammer by a man we later discovered called Peter Sutcliffe. Uh, Peter Sutcliffe, for those of you that are from outside the UK, was a serial killer that murdered 13 women in the north of England. The press, the media, they called him the Yorkshire Ripper. My mum, Wilma McCann, was the first. Do you know, I never thought I'd ever bounce back from that. I never thought I'd ever recover from that. I never thought I'd ever find or feel joy in my life again after that. After a number of months, the early the following year, we set up home with my father, my estranged father, and his new girlfriend, another council estate, uh, where I lived, and uh, up until this point, I've been asking myself, why, 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 why my mum? I'm laid in bed one of the first nights, and it came to me. I know why it's happened. Mum's been taken by God, you know, away from all this chaos, all this violence, all this drinking, all this stuff, and we're going to have a better life with my dad and his new girlfriend, she can be my mum. As far as the outside world's concerned, we're in a proper family now. Now, I don't know how that six-year-old boy that I was was able to think in that way, able to grasp that ray of sunshine in that dark cloud. But what I believe now as a 42-year-old man is that ability. You know, to find something good in a difficult situation is an ability we've all got. Didn't quite turn out the way I was hoping for with my father, though. He was, a, um, well, at times, a very violent man. He drowned the dog in the bath. He used to beat us with a stick, did my dad, at times, and stab me with a fork. I went off the rails a little bit. I was at shoplifting. I, was, I broke into the school, got arrested for that. He used to force us into the press-up position in, on the floor and it would threaten to kick you up again if your arms gave way. He put my stepmom in hospital with a broken rib, punctured lung, he got the picture. And all, while all this was going on inside the house, outside of the house, mum's killer was killing more and more women. I thought he was going to kill me. I'm going to show you a picture of me aged, um, well, I can't be sure, but eight or nine. You can imagine why I didn't feel quite as good as everybody else. People would come up to me at school and say, is it true about your mum being this Yorkshire Ripper's first victim? Is it true your mum was a prostitute? I hated those words. I hated what they were saying. But I thought, I believed that I wasn't as good as everybody else. I was damaged goods, never going to achieve anything. Life got better in 1981 because Mum's killer was arrested. And, uh, well, not completely because we still had my dad to deal with, so it wasn't completely better, but it was, it was better than it was. And, and um, about two years after Mum's um, killer was arrested, something incredible happened in my life. It was what it was, it was, it was my English teacher, Mr Hill. What a leader he was. See, he was able to see something in me that I didn't see for myself and he came up to me one day to Mr Hill and he said, Richard, why don't you enter the school public speaking competition? 
I thought about it. I thought there's no way I'm getting on that stage in front of the school with my second hand clothes. But then I thought about it again. I thought, what's the worst that could happen? I entered this speaking competition. I think it was the first time that I actually said, I can. I can at least try. I didn't do whatever else did. I didn't stand over here like a politician reading from notes. I didn't have any assistance. I didn't have any posters, no flip charts, no diagrams. I walked onto that stage with nothing except me and I spoke from the heart about the one thing that I knew something about. You're never going to guess. I'll show you. It was actually pigeons. My father kept pigeons. So do you remember that Kez, the film Kez with his kestrel? A bit like that. My dad kept pigeons. I knew all about them. They loved the talk. But I had a joker up my sleeve. It was a pigeon. Not on my sleeve, actually. It was in a box at the side of the hall. And I got this pigeon out of this box and I was ex extending its wings on stage and they were loving it. Then I let this pigeon go out of the double doors at the side of the hall, which were open. It was a fantastic achievement for me. Can you imagine how proud I felt? The next day in assembly when Mr. Stanley, who was um, head of year at the time, announced that Richard McCann had won first place. I nearly cried. I won the competition. Oh, I grew. I grew and I realised when I won that speaking competition, hey, I'm not completely damaged goods then. And maybe I could amount to something. Now, it's not a coincidence that I won that speaking competition and I'm studying in front of you right now. Next two years at school, fantastic. But then I left school, no qualification. Didn't take my exams. I left home at 16. A couple of dead-end jobs. I was ironing trousers. I was washing plates in a hotel. Minimum wage. I hated it. So I did something about it. I took a leap of faith. I leapt to this wonderful place called, well, London. I call this London. It's down south. I joined the, I joined the army. This is Woolwich Barracks in London where I did my basic training. And for the first time in my life, no one knew about my past. I said, oh, yeah, mum died in a car accident. And they accepted that. And when I finished there, oh, yeah, that, that, that's Woolwich Barracks at night. <laughs> when I finished there, I was posted out to Germany where my regiment were. It was fantastic. I got myself a German girlfriend. Who put it all behind me. But then Marshall Cavendish brought out a magazine, uh, the Murder Case Book series in 2000, um, 1989, December 1989, and my secret was out. People were talking about it. Um, basically, Peter Sutcliffe was on the first edition. And uh, my mum's photograph was inside. You could tell it was me. It was out there. I had a breakdown. I felt like I did as a young person again, not as good as everybody else, damaged goods. I ended up on the psychiatric ward of Hanover Military Hospital. They kicked me out of the arm and I came back to Leeds, where I'm from. And I started my journey again. I dusted myself down. I thought, okay, let's start again. Job stacking boxes in a warehouse. Stuart Hardy, the warehouse manager, a bit like Mr. Hill. See, he saw something in me that I didn't see for myself. And he took me to one side one day. He said, Richard, we're going to install a computer system in this warehouse. I want you to run it. He said, I spoke to Nick, the financial director. I'm going to get you a pay rise. I've told him, listen to this, I've told him your management material. Let me tell you, I grew. I actually grew. I started wearing a shirt and tie to work. I got this little office job. I got a pay rise after pay rise. Before long, I bought my own house. Now, this might not look like much to you here down here in Seven Oaks, but I bought my own house. I'm from council estates, foster homes, children's homes. People that own their own homes, oh, they're better than me. Or so I used to say. I thought about my mum look, looking down from up above, being really proud of her son, and it was a turning point in my life. It didn't last long, though. Because some of the friends I was working with, I didn't have many friends, but some of the guys I was working with were going out taking drugs every weekend. And I fell into that world. What they didn't warn me is where it was all going to lead. Speed, ecstasy, cocaine. I started falling in sick at work. Two of my friends died. I eventually lost my job. And I'm ashamed of this, and so I should be. I started dealing drugs to my friends. And I got arrested. I got sent to prison. In fact, this is HMP, or Her Majesty's Prison at Leeds. That is the same prison that my mum's killer was sent to when he was first arrested. I will never forget that journey from Leeds Crown Court, heading towards there, panicking. Oh my goodness me, how i am going to get through this? I mean, this is, this is not my people. Do you know how I coped with it? I told myself that God, if there is a God, God had stepped in to get me arrested so that I'll be given the opportunity to turn my life around. So the most important words we ever hear are the ones that we actually say to ourselves. I went in there with the right attitude. I said, I'll change my circle of friends and stay away from the drugs. But let me tell you, it was hell. It, 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 was, hell, it was hell. I found a guy that hung himself, tried to hang himself in prison. Most shocking sight I've ever seen. Locked up in a cell all day, not being able to go where you want to go and you know, do what you want to do is horrible. I mean, who here has served time in prison? One, two, three. <laughs> <laughs> See, well, no, it's like not to be able to do what you want to do and go where you want to go. Do you know what? There are more people that have not served time in prison that might as well be in prison because they don't do what they want to do. What they really want to do 
And they don't go where they have the potential to go because they walk around with these imaginary bars that are stopping them doing things, these limiting beliefs that we heard about earlier. I know about that stuff. I've lived my life like that. Came out of prison, came out of the, uh, the prisons, on the, the entrance on the right hand side. I walked out of there, 3rd of January 1997. Wow, that joy of being released left me about two months later when I found myself back in court, having my house repossessed. I remember the civil judge this time saying to me, Richard, you've got six weeks to get a job or you've lost your house. Wow, I'll never forget those words either. I went out there for interview after interview after interview. Nobody would give me a second chance. Until my final interview, my sixth and final week, Lauren Simmons, he said, Richard, can you start on Monday? I'll never forget those words either. I said, yeah. It was 1997, that was the year that my life began to turn around. And in that job, I, I, I went the extra mile that we sometimes heard about. Within three and a half years, I had my own department, people working for me. My salary nearly trebled in the time that I was there. I paid off all the money I owed to the bank sooner than I proposed. I changed my circle of friends. I took up salsa dancing. Anybody here do salsa? <laughs> Any salseros in the house? I changed my circle of friends and I got some counselling, two and a half years of counselling, going through all those things that I had issues with. My mum, my dad, the shame, the guilt, the limiting beliefs. But the main reason... It was all my failed relationships. I can't tell you everything in the time that I've got. I've had more relationships in my life that I can, well, I've probably lost count when I was 21. Always very insecure. Oh, they're going to leave me, then they would leave me. Oh, they're going to leave me, then they would leave me. They're going to leave me, then they would leave me. Have I got to stop this? Sandra said to me, the counselor, where do you want to be in five years' time? I said, I want to be married. I want some children. Some ginger children. <laughs> <laughs> we parted company. I learned one of my most important lessons in life. There's nothing wrong with asking for help. After that, my relationship was much healthier. And uh, things, were starting to fall into, things were starting to fall into place. I paid off the money to the banks, um, went on an assertiveness course. There was uh, all sorts of different things that I tried to, to grow as a person. Um, but then my sister Sonia stabbed her boyfriend. I thought, oh no, I didn't kill him, she just missed his heart. When she told me what he'd done to her, and I'll have to spare you the detail, I made a decision that was going to change everything. I'm going to write a book. The world has got to know what we've been through. I'm going to write a book about my life. And that's where that book came from. That book, do you know what? That book has liberated me. I always thought that my past was something to be ashamed of. I'm not anymore. Do you know what? It's 400,000 copies. It's around the world. It's in Japan, Croatia. Do you know one of the things I used to say to myself as a young child when I laid in bed when I'd had a beating from my dad? Don't worry, Richard, because when you get older, you'll be able to help people around the world. That's what I told myself as a young child. I get letters from people around the world that have read my words and have been inspired by them. It's amazing, isn't it? The, the world that we create for ourselves. And... Um, the year that that came out, and yeah, it wasn't a one bestseller, and it did knock Robbie Williams off the number one spot. I'm really proud of that. <laughs> um, anyway, that was 2004, the book came out. That was the year I met um, Helen, my, here's my happy ending, my wife. Uh, in a salsa club, she was a, she's a midwife. We met, uh, here she is, Helen, and um, we got married on my mum's birthday, the 1st of July, and we went on to our three wonderful children. Uh, there's my first sky with a lovely head of ginger hair. We got married on the Isle of Sky. Um, there's Ellis, my son, uh, been a bit uh, thought-provoking there behind that tree. And, and last of all, we've got little Isla. I love my children, and um, all I do is I shower them with words of inspiration and encouragement, and yes, they can make mistakes and learn by them, all that stuff that we know is so important to young people and adults as well. Um, and I can't wait to get back to them. 2004, I was at a conference. Despite me being able to stand in front of you right now, I was at a conference in 2004. I was, um, I was at the back, I was a psychologist speaking about the effects of a traumatic event on a child, what support they might need. When it came to questions and answers, I nervously put my hand up and I asked, just when would I better put my past behind me and be able to speak to people confidently? He said, you might just have to accept that you're as good as you're going to get. And I chose not to listen to him. I joined Toastmasters. I joined the Professional Speaking Association. I got myself some coaching. Am I so glad that I didn't listen to his words? And because, you know what, this is my 1,269th presentation in the last five years. And I was also coaching a premiership footballer in November uh, last year. I run speaky boot camps. And you know what? I'm so proud to have been able to walk out on the stage at the National Indoor Arena this year to 3,000 people. I actually ran out onto that stage. You could, I couldn't wait to get out there. One of the organisations that I speak for now is the Forgiveness Project. The Forgiveness Project, um, we go into prisons and we run workshops, etc. Uh, there they are, the Forgiveness Project. And um, not because I've forgiven because I've got a story to tell and it raises the, uh, the subject of forgiveness. I got asked by the Forgiveness Project to attend a conference two years ago. Desmond, Archbishop Desmond Tutu was speaking. I was three rows from the front and he spoke about the Truth and Reconcil Reconciliation hearings. 
that took place in the early 90s in South Africa. And he was describing this scene. I was mesmerized. He was describing this scene where these, these, these family members who had lost loved ones or had been maimed were in this hall. These four military men were marched onto the stage and, um, and this white officer turned round to the baying crowd and said, yes, it was me. I gave the orders. And then he said something incredible. He said, please forgive me. And Desmond Tutu is describing this, this scene and this presentation. And oh, honestly, I'm like on the edge of my seat. This crowd started clapping slowly. And then it spread infectiously. And then they were all clapping. And Desmond Tutu was said, because he was presiding, he was chairing over this meeting. He said, stop, stop, stop what you're doing. Take off your shoes. This is a holy moment. It's incredible. It's incredible. And then he said something even more incredible. He said, Forgiveness is not easy. It costs God his only son. But when it occurs, it has the capacity to change a situation. Those words came at me like a, like, like a tsunami of energy. And it, honestly, they hit me. And, 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 and all that energy, all that anger, sorry, that, that, that pent-up frustration about what he did and when he took my mum left me. They just left me. We were all told in this audience, I'm sure you won't want to speak to Desmond Tutu, but he's leaving now. Can you stay where you are? There'll be a gridlock as you're all leaving. Stay seated. And we all stayed seated. But do you know what? As Desmond Tutu left the building, something came over me. There he is, sorry. Oh, he should be there. <laughs> At night again. <laughs> Something came over me. He walked down the steps, he made his way down to the side of this hall and out the side door. It was involuntary. I couldn't stop myself. I just had to tell him. And I got up and I stand on people's toes like you do at the cinema when you go to the toilet. And I cut him off outside the door, three steps down. I said, just stop, stop. I've just got to tell you what's taken place. You've just helped me forgive the man that killed my mum. And then he looked up. And then he threw his arms around me. And then he hugged me what felt like an eternity and then he parted and we parted company and went our separate ways it was a day I'll never forget never ever underestimate the power of the spoken word thank you very much